companies in Wisconsin. But if you don't have a venue, if, you, if it's not easy for you to learn about this, if you have to travel to San Francisco or Boston, it just keeps all of us out of the game um, in a way. And a huge compliment to you for taking a day um, out of your busy schedule uh, to learn about this. So hopefully we can accommodate that need. Um, so let's start with um, what is the, the typical goal of your, of your customer experience? Something like that, right? This is the type of customer uh, we would all like to see. Um, if we get something like that, it's probably less satisfactory, and we definitely don't want that. Um, this is my son at a couple of months old. He still makes those faces today, especially the last one. He doesn't get what he wants. So uh, the question is now, how do we get those reactions? How do we get that reaction on the left, the happy, elated customer? in a digital world. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, this is the metaphor I like to use. There is a wave of disruption coming our way. Um, artificial intelligence is one of those components, but there are many, many more components. I'll introduce a few of them to you, but then we'll bring it home. How does all of that really impact the customer experience? At the bottom of this wave of technologies is a stack that we're probably all familiar with by now. So we have the internet, we have e-commerce, we have social, mobile, etc., etc. Uh, Jake mentioned my digital awakening in 2016. I spent a week in Silicon Valley, and there was a professor from Stanford University, and he declared that the age of social and mobile is over, and the age of AI had begun. And I looked around the room to see if I was the only one who hadn't got the memo. And then I came back to Wisconsin, and I started to ask other people, do you know? what AI is, and it was a little bit like your video. Um, there really wasn't a, an understanding of what it was, and that's when we started Advancing AI Wisconsin. My co-founder, Kurt Halbeck, is somewhere, he's in the back hiding there, uh, just back from Boston, so he's keeping himself current. So then we learn about new things. This, this next layer of technologies, artificial intelligence, blockchain, the internet of things, the cloud. And then you think, okay, so now I'm learning about that stuff, and all of a sudden it hits you, there's yet more. There is 3D and 4D printing, augmented reality, virtual reality. You're like, oh my goodness, this never ends. And indeed, it never ends. So there's more. There's 5G wireless and edge computing and self-sovereign identity. It's a learning journey. And we all need to be on that learning journey because all of these technologies are moving from a distant possibility to a very real reality that's impacting our businesses, but it's also impacting our customers' lives. And it's coming fast. Um, sometimes people criticize me for using the wave analogy where we're in Wisconsin, right? Uh, there's no huge waves on, on Lake Michigan. But I said, well, we're all building our little sand castles on the shores of Lake Michigan, and if that wave comes here, we're not really prepared. So it's moving faster than most of us really anticipate. So, Jake did a great job in explaining components and fundamentals of AI. Um, I'm not a technologist, so the way I found my way into understanding it was to compare it to basic human cognitive functions. And the first one is sensing and perceiving. You're seeing me right now. You're hearing me right now. Think about your smartphone. Your smartphone now has a high resolution camera. It can probably see better, at least than I can see. It can <coughs> listen to you because you can talk to Siri but it has other sensors. It has GPS, it knows where you are, it knows how you're moving, how fast you're moving, all of these crazy sensors that are embedded in there. So the machines have actually acquired the ability to take in information at a better rate, at a faster rate than we can. So one zero for the machines. Here are some, ex some examples, right? Optical character recognition allows a machine to translate handwriting into text. That's not yet understanding it, that's just recognizing it. But you know, when doctors scribble their prescriptions, and now a machine can actually read that as opposed to somebody has to call the doctor to say what exactly what medication is that. Uh, facial recognition is another piece. You, know, you recognize a face, and we have sort of an intuitive memory. We kind of know, we remember people most of the time. The computer does it more on an algorithmic basis. It overlays the pattern, it com compares the distances between points on that pattern, and then concludes that it must be person X because it's a unique equation. But it gets more complex, right? So in this image, there are dozens of people moving over a public place. 
and the software has learned to detect what are buildings, what are people, what are things that they carry, and then you combine that with recognition features that I'll get into in a moment, it can actually recognize here if someone in that picture is a potential threat. If they are behaving differently from the patterns of behavior that have been established by watching this place over a long period of time. That ability to perceive multiple things at the same time and keep track of all of them, that far exceeds what we could do as a human. We don't have that attention span and, and resolution power. So now we get to the second component. What you hear and what you see today, you relate it back to what you already know. The more you know, the easier it is to take that new piece of information and tie it back to that. Well, think about all the knowledge that is available in the world right now. And if a machine can access all of that knowledge, right, how easy it is for the machine to take what it sees and identify what it is, right? You can take a picture now of a plant and say, hey, Google, what is this? And boom, it comes back and it tells you what plant it is. Why? Because it has access to a library of thousands of pictures of every possible plant in the world. And it can do that with, with animals, with cars, with people, and so forth. Data is exploding. The blue part on the bottom is structured data, the traditional way of, we thought, of what we thought machines can detect, right? Structured data, easily accessible. Unstructured data might be what we upload on Facebook or Snapchat or whatever those apps are. And you might say, well, that's data garbage, right? Those are videos and, and pictures. Like, what can somebody possibly do with that? I'll give you an example. The government of India has a huge problem. People are not exactly truthful in their tax returns. They say, I made X, and really they made a lot more. And historically, they sent out tax collectors. And there was another problem with that. Sometimes they were a little rough on people, and sometimes they got bribed by people, so they still didn't collect the taxes. Now. They're going out and monitoring people's social media accounts. And when you post a picture with your new BMW, you're going to get a letter from the Indian tax authority that says, basically, we have a suspicion that you underreported your taxes, and we give you a chance to correct that. And the money is just flowing in the door, and it's all automated. There's no more human involvement in that. So unstructured data has value as well. Now the what, what used to be our domain, so it's 2-0 now for the machines, right? What used to be our domain is to make sense of it all, right? We could use the computers to do the dirty work for us, but then we make sense of it. We detect the patterns, and we can identify what it all means. And there's sometimes the pushback. Well, the machine can always only be as good as the people who programmed it. So let me take you through a little history of machine versus human uh, to defeat that that notion. So the first big moment was when, uh, I think it was Deep Blue, IBM's product, beat Gary Kasparov in chess, right? That was the first night. Oh my goodness, how is that possible? Now chess is a very structured, you know, it, it has lots of permutations, but it's all very structured and logical. So maybe that was inevitable that a computer with a lot of processing power could do that. But then Watson beat Ken Jennings in Jeopardy. This is natural language, right? You have to, you get a question, and you have to understand the question correctly, then you have to access all that knowledge that's out there in the world, and then you have to give the answer correctly in the right way. So that's not just structured move A versus B, et cetera, et cetera. So then came the next one, AlphaGo. Google programmed AlphaGo. Go is a board game where you have to surround your enemy with little stones on a field. It's considered to be the most complex game in the world that people thought that's definitely too hard for a machine to ever beat a human. But in 2016, AlphaGo beat the champion from, from South Korea. Now then people said, well, wait a minute. You gave that machine a 100,000 game library. So no wonder, right? It, it had 100,000 examples of how to beat an opponent. It can think at lightning speed. The human had no chance. So Google said, OK, we'll start over. We'll do this differently. Alpha goes zero. We're going to start from scratch. They let the machine learn by playing against itself. No library, no starting point other than the basic rules. So the machine plays against itself 10 million times. And it's pretty good, right? So then they let this machine play against the old machine. And it beats the old machine 
100 to 0, right? Doesn't lose. And so now, they have this machine play against itself, and they publish the games. And what's happening is that the greatest masters of the Go game are studying these games with a degree of fascination. And one of them said, this, this is like nothing I've ever seen before. This is like a game from the future, or how I imagined a game from the future. So this idea that the machine can only be as good as the people who programmed it may not always apply, right? Because the machine can continue to evolve and maybe evolve in patterns that we don't anticipate. We may soon see artwork <coughs> created by machines, music composed by machines that may blow our mind because it can, you know, maybe not all of it, but uh, it, it has a level of complexity that's, that's hard for us to comprehend. So now comes the final part, communicate and interact, and, and Jake did a great job again. Uh, we talk to Siri now as if it was another person, right, or Alexa. Uh, in fact, I just heard a fact that among the 10 first words that babies say now, Alexa, for the first time, has made that list. Mama, Dada, Alexa. <laughs> uh, so machines can communicate and interact back with us, whether that is uh, Siri, Alexa, or we have visual um, language translation, um, so you can basically operate and, and move around in foreign countries and have no problem navigating because you have instant access to the language. Or we have little companions, right? Uh, in Asia, they have a massive problem with the aging population. There aren't going to be enough young people to take care of the elder population. Maybe just enough to feed them and bathe them and whatnot. But what about the social aspect, right? And so a lot of people are already on social media and they're interacting with others, but what if you have an, an Alzheimer's patient or something like that and they keep telling the same story over and over? Who's going to listen to that forever, right? And these little machines, they can not only listen to you, they actually take note of everything that you say. They build an inventory of every story you've ever told and then they can relate back to that story. Oh, and you brought up Susan again. By the way, would you like to speak to Susan? Because I can see that she's online right now, right? So there's a level of um, comfort and connectivity that, that we can create in our lives that's going to be facilitated by machines who act as a stand-in for the child, the pet, the companion that we may no, no longer have. And the same thing here, a companion, a learning companion for a child that can reinforce what the child sees and learns. It can provide additional explanation to that, like in the old days maybe the mom or the teacher would have. But it can also monitor inappropriate content that the child sees and then interact back with, with the devices and block that content or you know, instantly flash that something is um, inappropriate. So we're going to have new forms of interacting with machines. Some other technologies, uh, augmented reality. So in augmented reality, we essentially can take a computer image and superimpose it into the real world. So here, for example, this student is looking at his own arm, and then the computer superimposes in, in his iPad or phone the anatomical information. And so that's a lot more fun to sort of learn you know, the, the anatomy of your body if you can see it in real uh, time. Or somebody goes shopping, and you actually see what that dress looks like without having to try it on. In fact, you can try on any dress in the world, because you don't need to have it physically available to you. The ladies over here like that a lot, <laughs> right? <clears throat> um, virtual reality, so the difference, virtual reality is where you literally go into an artificial reality. It's not a combination of a computer image over a real image. It's all in a virtual world. And these children are seeming to have a lot of fun learning in the virtual reality. Um, there is, um, there are several learning programs in, in Boston, they've just created an immersive room that simulates a Chinese village. And you can be in that room and you can interact with the Chinese villagers, speak Mandarin to them. It's called the Mandarin Project. Uh, to really, you know, you don't have to travel to China anymore to have an immersive experience in, in Chinese language. Or you mentioned Paul couldn't be here today, so you're going to have a virtual session. Well, what if we had virtual learning opportunities? There are some children maybe with disabilities, maybe they, they live too far away from the school that their parents would like to send them to, they might have the opportunity to attend class as an avatar, as a virtual representation. And what if everyone could choose their avatar? There's no more bullying for the way we look, because 
I'm going to have a cool avatar, and that's how I go to school. Or maybe the teacher could be the avatar. There's going to be new ways of, of interacting in the virtual world. A totally different technology, not just computer-based. It's in the real world, 3D printing, right? So we, we all used to a printer, and it prints out a piece of paper. Now 3D printers create a figure of something. And it could be a single material that is most common, but they also have multi-material printers. There's even a printer that prints cement, and you can make a house from it. Clothing. These little printers print components of clothing, and there will be, and there is, in fact, the first fashion collection 3, 3D printed at home. She doesn't look totally convinced, though, right? She's I've never <laughs> seen a model kind of like saying, like, no, what is this? But it's possible now. And think about what that would indicate for the disruption of, of value chains of customer experience, right? You, you pick the dress, and then you print it at home. Other key technologies, the list goes on and on and on. Drones, right? And it's not just the drone, it is the capability that sits behind the drone. Think about the devastation we just saw with flooding and, and tornadoes and hurricanes. So the insurance assessors have to go in now and they have to go home by home and assess the damage and it's going to take a while until the area is accessible, until they can get down the street with, with every incident. Now. They're flying this drone over the damaged property. The drone takes pictures, and it compares the, those pictures to a database of thousands or hundreds of thousands of comparable pictures. The computer calculates the damage. It you know, sends that information for approval. Maybe it's even an automated approval. It cuts the check, and an hour later, we're rebuilding our lives, as opposed to six weeks later, we've been living in a FEMA container in the meantime. Agriculture. Um, this is an example of a technology that was just purchased by John Deere, Blue River Technology built it. At the end of the, of the arm, there's uh, two things. There's a little camera, and the camera takes a picture of what it sees underneath, and it can distinguish, again, back to that recognition, it can distinguish the weed from the little lettuce plant. And then a robotic arm will apply a microdose of herbicide only to the weed. Right? So it's very surgical. Think about how many millions of tons of herbicide will never make it into our environment and how much money the farmers save based on that technology. So it's going to impact, as the prediction said, every industry in every country of the world. And we could go on and on and on and on. But we want to get now to, so what does it mean for the customer experience? I'm going to have four hypotheses that I'm going to share with you. And with each hypothesis, I'm going to close out with asking you questions. That's the privilege of a strategist, right? I get to ask you the questions, and you have to figure out the answers. So the first one is the relativity of the human interaction. So it used to all be about the human interaction, right? The happy customer, that's the reason we exist. So that's the one spectrum. Or on the other spectrum, it's not all about good experiences, right? Does anybody know the line that goes with that picture? No soup for you, right? The soup Nazi, right? So we, it's the good, it's the good and the bad in the in the human interaction. But what if there's a lot fewer chances to actually ever get to that human interaction? Right? The lady who didn't want to talk to a human because they were worried they might know who she is. So we are already in the online, mobile, and social paradigm where a lot of the information is now accessed through that. So the point of interest is shifting towards that online channel. More and more customers want that. Why? Well, rich product information, peer reviews. You, you said it yourself, right? You had to, you first did you all your research. My wife is a monster at this. By the time she gets in front of the salesperson, the salesperson has no chance whatsoever. She'll know everything about that product, about the competitive products. And online, you can do it 24-7 at your leisure, at night, in your pajamas. And now there's no risk. You know, you don't like it, you send it back. There really is no downside. You know, she gave me a, a pair of khakis for my birthday, but she ordered seven of them. And I was like, that's insane. And she said, well, I'm going to send the other six back. You know, just pick the one you like best. Now you enter AI and friends into all of that. So now we're going to have chatbots. We're going to have maybe virtual assistants. Maybe at some point, we'll have holograms uh, talking to us and interacting with us. And they can do a lot. They cannot just sort of, it's not just the old Q&A that was pre-programmed. They learn, they get better over time, they can interact, they can securely identify us, possibly with 
biometric features, whether it's a fingerprint or they look at our face and they actually rec recognize us. And it's going to evolve into what's called conversational platforms. Uh, Google just demoed a, a, a call, a mock call, they called somebody, right? And they learned that they had to put little L's and A's into the, into the um, machine language so that people really thought, hey, I'm talking to a human and it could basically complete that call, a customer service call, with a machine calling into the customer service center for about five minutes. We're gonna have detection of tone, of mood, of emotion, and possibly even crisis situation detection. When we did the digital county events, one of our use cases was 911 contact centers. And there's technology now that will allow the agent uh, to identify that there's a crisis going on, that there's a suicide risk uh, for, the, for the caller calling in. And um, some agents may be so good, they're so experienced that they would detect that regardless. But now the machine is looking for keywords, it's looking for intonation patterns to basically flag, this is a high risk situation, here are the questions you want to ask to verify whether there's a risk. I was talking to a pastor recently. He, he runs the fourth fastest growing church in America. And they're running out of people to man their contact center. They have a little contact center. And uh, you know, too many people are calling in. They don't have enough volunteers to staff that anymore. So we talked about, would it be acceptable if AI acted you know, in taking in the calls, maybe just as a, as a first wave, you know, just because what if somebody's in the queue for 10 minutes and they have an existential crisis, you'd rather take them right away. Well, what if the AI evolved to the point that it could actually act as a spiritual counselor? Would that be okay, right? And so he kind of tormented his brain whether that would be okay or not. So the customer preferences are clearly moving in that direction. 44% of shoppers prefer to use ch chatbots already rather than speaking to a real person. 90% expect a consistent experience across channels. Now the problem used to be that you had to make your website experience as good as the human experience, because the human was probably a lot better. But now, if we have these like super smart robots and they know everything, they know all the products, they know all the competitor products, and they can flexibly respond, now the challenge almost becomes, can we make the human side of the equation as good as our virtual experience? And 84% of customers now prefer to find the answer uh, using the information that's being provided um, online. By 2020, that's not distant future, that's just around the corner. 85% of customer relationship interactions will be through an AI powered service. That doesn't necessarily mean it's just talking to the machine, because AI powered can also mean it's a human powered by AI, meaning they have kind of like the Siri in their ear or they have the Siri listening into the conversation and giving them clues on what to ask next and so forth. But that's whopping and, and if you're not on that journey yet, you're kind of running out of time. I remember a conversation with a college professor and I talked to him about AI and so forth and uh, he brought in the dean and then the dean said, well, how much time do we have? And I showed him all the statistics, what you have to have by then, by then, by then. And by 2020, you know, the workplace, the workforce needs are such that you have to graduate people with these skills. And then he grew pale in the face and said, that's the class starting this summer. And I said, well, I guess you're out of time, so you better hurry. So there's a website along those lines, will robots take my job? And you can enter any job, and it will then calculate the likelihood of automation. How did they possibly do that? They took all of these thousands of jobs and disaggregated them. What are the different activities you perform typically in that job? And every activity has a likelihood of being replaced by a form of technology. Some are manual work that can be replaced by robots, others visual work that can be replaced by uh, character recognition, et cetera, et cetera. So have some fun entering your job. Here are some sales marketing jobs. So managers are totally safe, right? So my, my advice to students is go straight for the manager position. That's totally safe. But how do, you, how do you get there if all of the positions that lead there are at a high risk of automation, right? Um, this is not only important for us to enter our jobs, but we, enter, we want to enter the jobs of the people we currently employ because we have some responsibility. If you know, customer service rep in a, in a call center 
has a 70% chance of automation, what are we going to do for all those people? How do we prepare them uh, to be ready for that? Or for your children. If your children are thinking about a radiology career, think again based on the information that, that Jake just provided because the machine will be a heck of a lot better. So the website will tell you you're totally safe or you are doomed <laughs> if you're on the bottom. And we, we may underestimate the impact. So the CEO of Young Brands, that is KFC and Taco Bell, predicts that in you know, 10 years, by the end of the decade, robots will take over fast food jobs. And at first I was like, so what, the, they're going to flip the burgers and, and serve the burgers? But then I thought it through, right? So I'm going to McDonald's, and you know, every morning I see a lot of older people hanging out there. It's like, Breakfast can't possibly be that good that they're coming back every day, but they're coming back with a sense of community, a sense of recognition. So what if that little robot not just brings you your burger, but he also recognizes you, right? He says, hey, what's your name? My name's Michelle. Hey, Michelle, you're here with your kids. What are their names, right? So boom, boom, boom. Six months later, you, you're in a totally different town, and there comes the little robot, and he says, hey, Michelle, you're in town, and you brought your kids. Well, you didn't bring your kids. Like, how are your kids, right? No human could ever do that because they've never seen you before. But the machine can remember everything, every part of the conversation. It may remember your order. In fact, if you have a loyalty card, it may remember everything you ever ate. It's like, oh, you must be on a diet now because you wanted the salad today. <laughs> now, it may ask you whether it's OK to remember you. That would probably be a step ahead. But we underestimate the kinds of interactions that are going to be possible powered by machines because of all the capabilities that line up that we went through earlier. So here's your first set of questions. First, are your human points of contact digitally empowered? Do your agents have a Siri or Alexa equivalent where they can access all of your product information, all of your customer history? Or do they have to talk to a supervisor? Or do they have to get back to the customer and it's going to take a couple of days until they can get back, right? Are you empowering the humans in your contact centers? Second, how strong is your digital or your non-human point of first contact? If somebody comes in, is it the old clunky you know, IVR? Or is it a chatbot? Right? How strong is that first non-human point of contact? And how long will customers stay engaged in that experience? Can, they, they can't wait to zero out. I figured out now in some, in some voicemail systems, it doesn't work anymore. You, the zero out doesn't work anymore. It just repeats the menu. But when you start getting real upset, right, it, it has emotion detection. It's like, I want to talk to a representative. Oh, all of a sudden, let me connect you. Right? So that works. I just start yelling now if I want to get out of the queue. <laughs> Are you prepared to interact with your customers through augmented and virtual reality? Is that even on your radar screen, or was that just like, total science fiction, right? If these opportunities to present something through a hologram or to superimpose a picture, if that's a, if that's a possibility now, are you thinking about that? All the you know, cat litter or whatever, you know, I could show you your living room with the brand new furniture, what it would look like. You want to see that? You want to see that right now? Wow, you know, you can do that for me? Boom, here it is. Oh yeah, I like it a lot, right? So there's a new form of interaction that does not require the customer to come fully prepared, but you have new means of interacting with the customer. Would you ever consider having your customers meet with a robot in the real world? Now, you may or may not be in a business where that's feasible, but again, is that even on your horizon? Could you entertain that? I was talking to a CEO of a manufacturing company, and they just bought their first robot. And he said, day one, he rolled that thing into the, into the shop floor, and the employees were like, this is the end. We're done. This, you know, this is going to take over all of our jobs. Everybody hated the robot. Three months later, everybody loves the robot. Why? Because the robot is doing the back-breaking carpal tunnel type of work that somebody had to do, but nobody wanted to do. Now the robot is doing it. So now the employees are making lists of things that the robot should do, and they're buying more. And what other problem did they solve? They had to turn down work because they couldn't find enough workers. Now they can take in orders again, right? So the, the, the safety and security of the company uh, is, is secured because they have a workforce supplement. 
So are you ready to, to define, there's a typo there, excellence in digital experience? What is excellence in digital experience? What does that mean for you? Are you ready to define that? Maybe today is that starting point of your journey. Maybe this is your digital awakening. Maybe you're already way on that journey. Push it to the next level. Are you ready to define that? Or will you assume a contrarian posture? I'm going to talk later about backlash. There will be a moment where people say enough is enough and too much is too much, and I want to talk to a human. I used to work for a bank that prided itself on 24-7 human accessibility, right? That's a contrarian approach, and it, oops, it, it could very well work, um, but you have to think it through. You have to think the, the game through. All right, second part, the race for information and knowledge. And it's not so much a race between you and your competitors. It's a race between you and your customers. Everything is being digitized. If you could see your Google profile, you would probably faint. Everything that Google has recorded about you, or Apple, where you have been in the last four weeks, based on your phone that's tracking everything. What you've ordered, what you've looked at, what you've searched for, what you like and what you don't like. What you order Monday mornings versus Friday afternoons. All of that is being recorded and it's being analyzed. Right? And the world around us is full of sensors. Sensors for weather, for traffic, for everything. There's apps now that tell us exactly which road to take because you know, there's a little disturbance on that road and five minutes later it's cleared up. It's all in real time. In China, they now have cameras everywhere in public places and they monitor what people are doing and they recognize your face. They know who you are. And if you demonstrate bad behavior in public, you get points on your ledger. And if you have too many points, there's going to be consequences. So people are now, you know, on the one hand, this is sort of very Orwellian. On the other hand, it's a very safe place because everybody knows there's consequences for bad behavior. And the ability to analyze all of that information. You saw the explosion of data and the ability to analyze all that data. There are experiments where people basically say, let's see how good we are in predicting what Michelle will do and where she will be a year from now. Right? And these programs are scarily effective because they take all of that history and they predict patterns of behavior. You may be walking down the street and you get a little text message that says, hey, in three minutes, you're going to come by um, one of the franchises of your favorite fast food restaurant or your favorite restaurant. You know, are you hungry? No, oh, it's it's actually around that time that you typically eat, so you should be hungry. Should I order your favorite meals? By the time you get there, it'll be ready to be served. Right? We're going to have this real time interaction. The recognition of there's a man who wants to get married. Let's show him the engagement ring. Right? So it's going to be a totally different world for us. <clears throat> so. Information is an opportunity, but it is also a challenge. The first component of that is the increasing amount of internal and external information. You are probably all recording interaction information with your, with your customers. Maybe it's still you know, the old, we're entering, we're entering it into the contact system. Maybe you are saving the entire conversation and you have a language recognition that translates that into text, so all the text becomes searchable. And maybe you have a way of, of sort of analyzing that. And then you can append external information. You can buy some of that intelligence from Google and from Apple and from others and append it to your customer profiles so you have a richer understanding of what it is that they do, what they like, et cetera, et cetera. That's your opportunity. But guess what? The customer is going to come to expect that you know that, right? If Google knows all of that, if I can enter something in Google, and it finishes the sentence for me, well, why can't you do that when I call you? Why don't you know these things about me? So customers expect that you have access to all knowledge at all times, because they do, through Siri, through Alexa, etc. That you have a gapless record of their history, and that you can access and act on that knowledge in an instant. Not, let me talk to my supervisor, let me get back to you tomorrow, that it is instantly available. But then it gets better or worse. The ability to detect complex patterns, right? It's not even as simple as kitty litter after kitty food. There's much more complex patterns. And so 
Are you able to present your customer with the best possible choices in that moment that they're contacting you? Or can you proactively reach out to them based on your prediction where and when they're going to have a need? So customers will come to expect that you know what they want right when or even before <coughs> they want it. Because it's every Friday afternoon that I order my fish at that, at that place. So 10 minutes before, I could get my notification. That your recommendation will always come close or be on target, right? Amazon, sort of like people who looked at this also shopped for, that's going to get more and more personalized over time. And customers will come to expect that you are good at this, that you're not randomly cross-selling something that you want to push, but that you are really cross-selling the best, the next best product that is truly best for the customer. And finally, that you learn from their no. Every time I open my email, I get asked by Google if I want to expand my mailbox. Every day I say no. It's annoying. Why are they not learning from my no? I don't want to do that. Now, some of these capabilities will come embedded in your platforms. And I'm not endorsing Salesforce because I used the, they have the prettiest picture to put in here, right? Whether it's Microsoft Azure or IBM Watson or Salesforce, AI capabilities will come packaged, standard, in your customer contact solutions. Sometimes you may have to develop um, you know, custom solutions. That depends on how you want to play the game. Do you want to have the skills that everybody else has? Or do you want to develop unique skills? But the flip side of, of customers will expect that is you will have tools available at your disposal. So here are your questions again. How seamless is your ability to collect customer information? Do you have a gapless record? Or do you purge calls that are two years, three years old? If you're doing that, you're really impairing the ability to train your AI. Because the more data you have, the better you can train that AI, the better the pattern recognition will become. And how sophisticated are you in extracting value from that? I was talking to a plant manager, and he said that they have sensors on all the machines now, so every day they are extracting 15 terabyte of information from that factory. But they're only able so far of analyzing 5% of that information. There's probably a massive amount of information that is not yet analyzed for value. So are you actually, when you're, when you're saving all that customer information, are you getting to value? Can you predict what the customers need and when they need it? How will you ensure that the customer and your team can access the information and are, can access sort of the best opportunities that are available to them? It's sort of classic in banking that you know you have people or even in phone companies, you have people in a certain product and a certain contract, and you know it's not the best product for them because they could earn more interest or they could have lower fees, they could have you know better data. We don't contact the customers. We don't make it visible to them that there are better opportunities. Eventually, that kind of short-term thinking, optimizing our bottom line, is going to come back to haunt us because others will make that step. They will make the best possible opportunities accessible at all times. Are you preparing yourself for an accelerating race to extract value from that knowledge? It is beyond what you can do with just a smart human mind. It is beyond what you can do with your predictive analytics in Excel. McKinsey predicted that the biggest impact of AI will be in those areas where you are already using predictive tools, because it will make those predictive tools so much more powerful. Level three, the ability and the responsibility to use that. If you are gearing up for that race, how will you think about the ethical component of that? So we have a spectrum of information. On the, on the far left, we have objective information, what we should know about our customers, what they told us in, our, in their profile when they opened the account, the information we have collected about them, maybe something that we appended from an external data source. So that's all objective. Now then we draw conclusions from them behavioral patterns, right? We see, oh, okay, they're ordering at a certain rhythm. They're ordering at a certain volume. They have a preference for the low price products or for the, for the safe products, etc. We, we come to simple conclusions. 
Then we infer preferences and traits. I'm sure that Google has a, you know, um, a classification of shopping personalities, and I'm in one of them, and my wife is in a different one. I know that for sure. But we don't know what our shopping personality is. We don't know what kind of psychographic traits they have assigned to us that goes beyond our own awareness. But you can bet on it that that is out there. And then you have these situational modifiers to know, yes, Oliver has that preference, but not if it's early morning. He only develops that preference after lunch, or uh, not if he's with his family, right? <coughs> Epigenetic modifiers are how do the people around you influence your behavior? You, know, you, you behave in one way when you're shopping by yourself. You may be behaving differently when you're shopping with your husband or with your kids, right? So that's the latest trend, and I'll talk about that a bit more in a moment. But here's now the mirror of that. So that's the availability of that information. On the left side, customers will say, I absolutely expect you to know this. If you don't know this, you are behind the curve. I'm going to move to somebody who does know that about me, because you should know it. You get to that middle part, it's like, wow. How did you know that? Right? That's awesome. I appreciate that you just holographed me my future engagement ring. Mm -hmm. Or, wait, how is that possible? How did you possibly know that I'm here right now in front of this store and you're sending me the text? Right? I'm, I'm getting a little uncomfortable here. Right? So there'll be different segments. And the risk on the far end is, is how dare you? How dare you invade my privacy to this degree that you know so much about me? And that's where the possibility of a backlash could start. How many of you have proudly completed or are still working on a 360 degree customer profile? Great show of hands. Nobody? Nobody has a 360 degree profile? Oh, well, we need a 360 degree profile conference. Um, but a lot of companies over the years have been working on that, right? Getting information from the various system in which we store customer information into one consolidated view. In banking, that was a big deal. What do they have in mortgages, home loans, deposits, et cetera, et cetera? The 360 degree view of the customer was the, the holy grail. Well, there's a new view, the ecogenetic network assessment a client in the context of his relevant ecosystems. If I analyze banking information and I, I see that, okay, so now that I know everything about Oliver, all of his banking relationships are now accessible and we're analyzing that. But wait a minute, Oliver is making a transfer to California every, every month. It always goes to the same person. That person must be in a certain relationship to Oliver. Ah, same last name. Oliver has a kid in college in California. So now let's analyze what we can find out about that person. And Oliver is married. So what do we know about Oliver's spouse? And what do we know about the people who are interacting with Oliver? There's a company in Milwaukee called Social Leads. They won the reverse pitch from Northwestern Mutual. And they are analyzing people's Twitter feeds, first level and second level, to determine what are the life events in somebody's that are articulated in their environment that would indicate that they are maybe a good candidate for wealth management or a good candidate for life insurance, but also what are the indicators that they are a likely buyer of that product, right? So that is taking epigenetic information, information from your environment to draw conclusions about you. So the 360 degree profile is no longer enough because now you need to have all that contextual information about your customer as well. Here's another scenario. What happens if the robots are starting to talk to the robots? Hey Alexa, order my favorite pizza, right? So Alexa accesses your personal order history, and it's, you know, okay, so typically you go to Domino's and you have the sausage and pepperoni pizza. Um, let me verify that, yep, 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 that's, that's your favorite. Maybe I confirm with you, are we talking about sausage and pepperoni? Yep, yeah Alexa, you should know that by now. All right, Alexa interfaces with Dom, which is Domino's virtual assistant, she puts in the order. Dom basically puts the order into their pizza making system. So somebody puts the pizza on there. Then it goes into the driver. Dom is connected to the driver, has the GPS coordinates. When the driver is just a minute away, Dom tells Alexa, hey, tell your user to get off the couch and go to the door. Payment is already settled between Alexa and Dom. 
So um, Alexa lets you know to get to the door, get your pizza, bon appetit, right? Everything in between, Alexa get my favorite pizza, ding dong, here's your favorite pizza. Everything in between was machine to machine communication. But what if I say, hey Alexa, see if you can shave off a few percent of that price, whatever it is that I'm ordering, right? So now Alexa goes out and accesses all the alternative purchase options. And a negotiation algorithm could lead her to propose uh, lower prices to all available interfaces. And maybe those interfaces say, well, Alexa, do you have a coupon? What are all the available electronic coupons? Or they could say, well, they have a negotiation algorithm as well. They say, hey, Alexa, I see you've ordered from me 20 times. I'm going to cut you some slack. I'm going to give you a 5%. Well, oh, Alexa is not happy with 5%. She's negotiating in parallel with 20 different interfaces to see if she can get a better deal somewhere, right? So some interfaces will not have negotiation capabilities. Others may. So those of you who don't have that, you're out of the race at that point in time, right? <laughs> now, and you may not learn that that inquiry has ever come in because it was machine to machine, right? And Alexa made the decision who she's gonna continue to negotiate with. So now, Alexa and her counterparts utilize their negotiation algorithm. It may be like a chess match. Maybe they go back and forth 10,000 times until it's settled, right? We don't care, right? We wouldn't do that, but the machines don't care. They go back and forth until they've settled on the optimal outcome. How much discretion will they have? It depends on how you program them. Eventually, the best result will be presented back. But here's the problem now. Alexa is not truly a personal assistant. Alexa now informs all other Alexas all over the world that if you follow this algorithm, you have the best shot at getting a 16% discount on that product. Your machine may have just issued a 16% universal discount to everyone. Can you afford to do that? And what if your machine can't negotiate? Then an increasing number of inquiries you'll be left out of, right? This is a reality that we're not thinking through yet because we're, we're still on this, how can we have the machine interface with the human? Well, what if that human has a machine as well and they want to do the same thing? So now our machines need to be talking to each other. How are we gonna program for all of those interfaces and all of those, you know, who, who's gonna have the best chess computer in a way that's gonna win and not just win that one interaction, but win in the long term. So, questions for your digital leverage strategy. Do you or will you have a philosophy that establishes boundaries? Are you gonna use all available information, no matter the consequences, or will you say, enough is enough? You know, Microsoft, Google, they have established internal policies, boundaries, because there is no regulation as to what their AI can do. You probably heard about this Amazon blow up on how their recruiting AI was discriminating against women and they had to turn it off because it basically concluded that because women take breaks, they have children, that that was not as good as not having children, so it was biased against women and Amazon had not factored in that, so they had to t turn it off, right? So which boundaries will you establish up front before you build the machine, before you teach it, how will you prevent those biases from occurring? Will you put the customer first in presenting value choices back to them? Or will you try to present the third best choice first because it's better for you bottom line? What will be your philosophy there? How far will you go in empowering your digital resources? How much discretion will you give them? How much supervision will you install? How will you audit their behavior? If they are self-learning systems, what if they learn something that makes you uncomfortable? How will you know that they've learned that and that they're applying that new algorithm now? Are you thinking the digital game through beyond the first few moves? It's one thing to get into the game. It's the second thing to really think it through and establish those boundaries up front. And now the last one, preparing for the backlash. That is thinking the game through all the way. Cambridge Analytica, right, the most publicized data scandal, basically accessing user data from Facebook without their authorization, and Facebook kind of turned a blind eye, and there's many more like Cambridge. My heritage, huh? Has anybody done the DNA test yet? So they have 92 million records breached. So now not only do they know 
everything about my personality profile, now they have my DNA. Uh, now I'm really toast, what can they do with that? Exactus, 340 million records breached, they are a data aggregator. So if they, if they get breached, right, now all of my data that has been accumulated is available. And in India, um, an organization that saw the equivalent of social security, right, was breached, so now they lost 1.1 billion records of people's most sensitive information, right? So at some point, we will say, enough is enough. I'm gonna reclaim my digital identity. Well, today, we can't do that. We're not empowered to do that. We can't go to Google and say, delete my account. In Europe, they just passed legislation that you can do that. That first of all, you have a right to see what is in your account or what is in your file, and then you can claim it back. You can say, I'm gonna take um, ownership now of my data, and they have to purge that data. Well, where are you gonna put that information? So this is the concept that's just emerging called self-sovereign identity. Today, our healthcare information, our financial information, our shopping information, our insurance information is with lots and lots of different providers all over the world, right? We don't have control over ourselves, our digital representation in the virtual domain. The idea of self-sovereign identity is to create a safe vehicle that allows us to do that, that we can claim back that digital identity, and then we can issue authorizations. I'm gonna tell my doctor it is okay, I'm gonna give you a code that allows you to access my health information until I reject it, and I'm gonna allow maybe my broker to access my financial information, right? I'm gonna be in control of my digital identity. And this concept will then also allow you to issue proxies. So you could tell the company that you wanna be bidding on that house and you get issued a certificate that says, this is a credible buyer, but we're not gonna tell you who it is. You're not gonna be able to racially bias or have any other bias. This buyer is credible, they're good for the money, here's the bid. We will not tell you who they are, right? Now you could say, well then I'm not accepting the order, right? Or if I say, Amazon, I want all this stuff, but I'm not telling you who I am because I don't want you to add it to my record. So now Amazon can say, well then I'm not shipping it to you. Well, then I'm gonna find somebody who will and eventually Amazon will bow to that. So this is gonna be another battle between who actually owns the information. And a lot of it is gonna be tied to what we just discussed a minute ago. Those who demonstrate ethical and responsible use of customer information and put it to use for the good of the customer, they will not have a huge backlash issue because customers will trust them. But those who abuse the information and take it to their own advantage or sell it to others, they're gonna face the backlash. Does anybody here not have a smartphone? Is anybody here who still has an old-fashioned flip phone? I was gonna say, welcome to the resistance, brother. <laughs> oh no, I, I put it out. But I have my flip phone. I've, I've decided that it's not okay that every, every one of my moves is being tracked. I've separated telephony and data, I'm engaging with data on my iPad. It's not that I'm anti-technology, but I wanna make that decision when I interact with it. So here are your questions for your backlash strategy. That may be way down the road, but thinking it through now is actually gonna position you for the time when that occurs. Will you stand out or be guilty by association when that backlash occurs? Will you have a record that says we were ethical responsible, and we valued the interest of our customers. Do you care if it's out more than five years, right? Achoo. If that backlash is way down the road, I'm gonna make money now, I'm gonna boost my capabilities now, I'm gonna extract value from knowledge now, and then we'll deal with the backlash when it occurs. Or are you designing a digital strategy right from the start when you showed your values, right? Honesty is a value. So how does that value then impact your digital strategy, right? What are the safeguards, policies, and procedures you put in place to protect customer information? And not just the information, also protect customer interests. If you know that there's a better product for that customer, will you offer it to them? Or will you keep collecting the extra profit? Would you prosper in a world 
in which customer information becomes a privilege again. We're back, we're coming full circle, right? We have to earn the customer's trust. No soup for you versus you know, the nice customer agent. Maybe we will come full circle. And so first we'll have to learn to play in that digitally enabled world. Right? If we abuse our power in that game, we may face a backlash that puts us on the wrong side of the equation. Lots of questions for you to mull. The wave is coming. We all need to get ready. I'm not the ultimate expert. I'm just a few steps ahead of you. And opportunities like today, opportunities like the happy hour where you can connect with others, um, hopefully create the appetite in you to take your first steps on that journey, seek information. There are experts here in the room. Uh, talk to them about how they can help you with that digital strategy. Thank you very much. <laughs>